I'm Brian Hoskins. I'm a director of the Grantham Institute here at Imperial College London. And it's a great pleasure to have here today Professor Thomas Stocker. Uh, Thomas has come here to give our annual lecture and it's uh, great to have him here. He's, in particular, he's an incredibly busy, busy person at the moment as he's been uh, co-chair of the Working Group 1 of IPCC and they launched their report in September. So, Thomas, first I'd like to ask you about this report. Um, what, what do you think it sets out to do? What does the IPCC report set out to do? Well, quite generally, uh, the IPCC reports come in three installments. Uh, each of the three working group is preparing a, an assessment of what we know about the risks of human-induced climate change, but also their impacts and the possibilities for mitigation. Working Group 1 has looked specifically at the scientific basis of climate change, so typically we look at uh, what has been observed in the climate system, in the atmosphere, what changes do we measure in the ocean, in the cryosphere, how much mass, for example, has Greenland lost over the last uh, few years. We then go on to uh, assess our understanding of these changes. Can we attribute them to specific causes, such as natural climate variability, or the increase of greenhouse gases. And finally, and most importantly, there is uh, several chapters about climate change projections. In other words, how will climate evolve in the next 100 years in response to various scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions? Now, but why is it so important to do this? I and mean, who's going to receive this? Who's going to take any notice of this? Uh, of course, the requesters of these uh, information uh, is the governments of the world. They have uh, started that process in 1988 by founding the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change with a view to provide scientific information to the first Rio conference which took place in 1992. And the first assessment report of IPCC has been published two years before that legendary conference to inform uh, the governments of the world about the status of the climate system and the status of the scientific knowledge. Um, I think it's absolutely important if you want to take informed decisions about what the governments have now declared to be one of, of the greatest challenges of our time. So the governments of the world need this information to make their decisions in, we recently had the Warsaw meeting and that sort of process. That's right. It's not only the governments that ultimately make use or can make use of this information. It's not privileged information. It's absolutely public information. Everybody is invited to inspect these reports. Uh, we have taken great care in this report to actually use an understandable language uh, where the citizens can actually uh, appreciate and learn about the status of the climate system. Yes, yeah, so they, they provide a sort of textbook for the uh, researchers and they provide something for the governments and they provide something even for the citizens of the world. You That's think? right. It's, uh, it's, uh, you could say it's almost a multi-purpose uh, endeavor by these many scientists who have dedicated so much time, effort and, uh, and intellectual power in this endeavor. And what they're doing is assessing the science but not doing the science. Can you sort of elaborate on that? It's very important that uh, it's, a, it's a division of labor, if you wish. Uh, the scientists and the scientific community carries out the investigations as they would do in any case, in all the fields, mm. in particular in climate science, uh, all around the world. But then there is this periodic process where the governments call for a comprehensive assessment and what this assessment does is to screen the peer-reviewed literature what is out there in terms of complex papers complex publications results analyses and take that literature and assess it in terms of what can we say in a robust manner in a dependable manner on specific issues such as the observation of changes in temperature in the atmosphere, the understanding of climate change. In addition, in view of the preparation of such a comprehensive report, the climate science community starts model simulations in a 
concerted and coordinated effort. And these model simulations are then available to be analyzed uh, in the course of this assessment. So some, sometimes you hear people refer to IPCC models. They aren't really IPCC models, are they? There are neither IPCC models nor IPCC scientists. IPCC is a process. The models are developed in uh, many centers around the world with their specialists, uh, government lab, university labs. Um, they are together uh, through the World Climate Research Program under the umbrella of the World Meteorological Organization, which coordinates uh, in an autonomous manner, independent of IPCC, apart from the timing of yeah, uh, yeah. these simulations. So it sort of coordinates, in, in some sense, it provides a time scale for which that's right. will happen. It provides a, a time mark. By this yeah. time, we would yeah. need yeah. some yeah. results that yeah. uh, we can assess. So you were co-chair of Working Group One, and that's a huge role. What just what was it like? Um, a huge responsibility. Uh, at some stages, at the beginning of the task, you wonder uh, whether it's going all right, whether uh, you will be able to assemble a powerful and a, a good functioning author team. I think we were very lucky and fortunate to have an extremely highly motivated author team who all worked together mm. collectively on this uh, a product, uh, on this goal to produce a robust, uh, comprehensive assessment report. And that was a, a rewarding experience to see how this group, uh, in, a, in a good collaborative and yet critical spirit, produced 14 chapters uh, ranging from observations through understanding to projections and then extracting from that the so-called summary for policymakers, which is that core document that then is delivered to the governments. Now, the scientists can't all agree all the time. They come, the huge variety of scientists coming, they, they can't agree. Does that give a problem when they don't, don't agree? Um, they do agree on certain things. We all agree on Newton's law. We all yeah. agree on facts that science has produced over the years. And that's no different in climate science. There are hypotheses. There are emerging facts. And ultimately, at the end of such a process, you are collecting facts, like the fact that the Earth has been warming over the past 100 years or the fact that the carbon dioxide concentration today is more than 30% higher than ever in the past 800,000 years. So there are facts, and these facts are not contended in the scientific community. But there are other issues where there is indeed a, a deep scientific discussion before arriving, perhaps, at a consensus that can be reported. But there are also examples in our report, in, in the assessment, where a consensus has not been reached. And in these instances, we are actually very clear. We say, in this particular issue, for example, uh, on uh, the role of aerosols and precipitation and clouds, uh, in specific technical details, a consensus could not be found. Let's turn to tonight's talk. Uh, in your title, you have the term Anthropocene. Now, could you tell, tell us what you mean by that term? Anthropocene is a term that has been coined by uh, Paul Crutzen, uh, a Nobel laureate on atmospheric chemistry and uh, the ozone hole uh, discovery and the understanding of the processes behind it. Um, he has realized, like uh, many scientists in our community, that man is changing climate, not only in terms of the temperature changes, but also and foremost uh, because of the chemical composition changes in the atmosphere with all the consequences mm -hmm. that that has. Now, Paul Kurtzen has uh, then put himself into the shoes of a scientist who investigates the Earth system in a hundred years' time, or in a thousand years from now, and ask the question, would that scientist be able to detect a change in 
the geolo by then geological or by then paleoclimatic record that would allow that person to redefine a new epoch. And his conclusion was yes, there is a new epoch that is uh, different from uh, the Holocene, the past 10,000 years, and that is the Anthropocene, the era where man put a lasting imprint on the Earth system. Mm -hmm. So if you drill down, you'll see there was different species yes. or maybe different chemicals? That well, were... what I can already say quite safely, if uh, we drill our ice cores uh, from mm -hmm. the University of Bern, still mm -hmm. in a thousand years time, I doubt that, but uh, <laughs> assume we do anyway. that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, those colleagues would actually find increased carbon dioxide concentrations in those bubbles. Biden. How about the two degree target? Um, the UNFCCC interpreted dangerous climate change in the end as being a global average temperature of two degrees as some sort of upper bound. Is this still achievable, do you think? That's part of my lecture uh, uh, tonight. Um, so we, we shouldn't preempt it too much, but uh, uh, I can just report what the assessment uh, of our working group uh, has concluded, and that is that the two degree target under the lowest emission scenario is still a possibility with a rather li high likelihood. But we need to be very much aware of the requirements that this scenario carries along with it, um, and I should refer here to Working Group 3 of IPCC, which will look in details uh, at these requirements. One requirement, for example, is that many models require by the end of the 21st century, around 2070 onwards, negative global emissions of carbon dioxide, which means essentially sequestration of carbon dioxide or removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now whether or not this is technically feasible, that's mm -hmm. left to the experts. Um, the physicists just carry out calculations under that assumption and under these assumptions the models indeed stay below two degrees warming. But it emphasizes that two degrees is just maybe just still possible. That's but, right. But it's it, not going to be easy. Exactly. It's a very ambitious goal and sometimes if you look back um, 40 years where the top scientists already pointed to this problem of rising carbon dioxide concentrations and their origin mm -hmm. and their consequence, a two degree target would have been a goal with a concerted global effort that would have been achieved in a much more easy way than it is mm. now. Mm. So it's getting late. It's getting late and we also know from uh, science that these options are not here to stay. Mm. Some options actually will disappear rather soon. What role do you think scientists have to play in engaging in these sort of po policy issues? I think it's important to uh, keep a, a certain clearly defined distance between policy making and scientific information. And I think uh, the process of IPCC ensures that because in our procedures it's laid down very clearly and explicitly that our assessments should be policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. So you will not find in any of our reports a recommendation that the world community must mm. uh, achieve such and such a target or must reduce emissions. This is a decision by the policy makers on behalf of their communities for which they are taking the decisions. Um, our task is clearly defined to deliver the scientific knowledge in terms of scenarios, what if cases where basically the decision maker is informed about what science tells us about consequences of certain choices. But taking off your IPCC hat now as an individual scientist, when 
maybe not you for the moment because you're an IPCC man for another few years. That's right. Um, but someone else, uh, a young scientist, and they think this is an important issue. They're doing science relevant to this. Do you, what do you think about their engagement in the policy, going towards the policy side? Ultimately, uh, I welcome very much uh, a, a deeper involvement of scientifically literate persons in the entire societal process of decision making. I think there is a shortage of scientists in society, quite generally, but more particularly in policy. And any human being that has a good scientific background and therefore appreciates uh, and is able to put into context what the science is delivering um, is a good thing. So uh, yes, I, I fully endorse that, but it, ultimately it's a personal decision where that individual scientist feels uh, can be of best use uh, to society. It may be in inventing a new machine, it may be in um, finding a new theory, or it may be in informing directly the policymakers. Thomas, thank you very much. We look forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you very much, Brian.